in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to you this day. My name is Teresa Johnson and I'm the pastor here at Smyrna First United Methodist Church and I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. I pray that you encounter a special transformative time and, and encounter our Lord in a powerful way during this time of worship. The Sunday marks an especially important day in the life of the church. Uh, first of all, for the church at large, it's Ascension Sunday, a day when we remember how 40 days after Easter, our Lord ascended to heaven to reign with the Father at the right hand of the Father forever, pronouncing himself firmly Lord over all creation and Lord over all of our lives. And then second of all, it's also Aldersgate Day in the Methodist Church. And so on this day, we remember Wesley, how Wesley came to an ordinary Bible study. And during that time, he had his heart strangely warmed as he felt the presence of God in a mighty way and was convicted that he could trust in Christ and that he was indeed forgiven and saved. And then aside from these two milestones, we're also going to honor our graduating seniors today and pray God's blessings over their lives. And you might also know that tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so we'll also uh, pray and lift up our um, veterans who have lost their lives for the case of freedom. And so again, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. And so now I invite you to just settle in in your armchair or your couch or wherever you might be worshiping from and kind of cleanse your mind and your heart of anything that might be distracting you and prepare to meet our God, for that is what we are about to do. If you have a candle around the house, you might want to take a moment and just light it to help create a sense of um, a worshipful kind of atmosphere as we light a candle remind, rem reminding us that as we worship, the presence of Christ is with us. Christ, who is the light of the world, is in our midst, wherever we might be worshiping, whether it's in a church building or not. And now would you all pray with me this morning? O oh, gracious and holy, awesome God, Lord, we do come to you today in, in your presence from wherever we might be, ready to meet you, ready to encounter you, encounter you in, in word, and prayer, and song, and scripture, and all the other ways that you might speak to our hearts. And so I pray now that you might strangely warm our hearts as you did Wesley's heart all those days ago, all those years ago. Prepare us to encounter you, our almighty God, as we come to meet you in this place. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the Son sets free. Oh, His free. forsaken. I am who you say I am. You 
go to the Lord in, in prayer with me as we offer up our praises and our concerns to our Lord and our God. Let's pray. O oh, almighty and awesome God, Lord, we thank you for the ability to gather from wherever we might be this day to meet you. Lord, let it never be a trivial thing that, that we can simply come to you, our almighty God and our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, and talk to you like a friend and hear from you a word of, of guidance and inspiration that you would offer for our lives. And so we thank you for that holy privilege. We are especially mindful on this Ascension Sunday of, of the Ascension of you, Jesus, and how you left this, this world bearing the, the scars in your hands and your side and the sacrifice you made in love for us. You left this earth bearing those scars to, to go back to heaven where you belong and to be with the Father Almighty, where you will rule this, the cosmos forever as our Lord and our Savior. And so we thank you that, that we have a God where those two things intermingle, our personal friend and our Savior, and Lord over all who hears our prayers and intercedes for us. Lord, let us never cease to, to be mindful of how awesome that is and the holy privilege of who you are and the relationship that we have with you. And this Sunday, we also come as Methodists mindful that it's Aldersgate, that on that day so long ago that, that you gave John Wesley that strangely warmed feeling in his heart that even as he was in the middle of his own wilderness journey and, and searching and struggling and looking for you, Lord, that, that you came to him at the most unexpected and unlikely kind of scenario, just an ordinary Bible study. Lord, you breathed life into Wesley and strangely warmed his heart so that he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could trust in you, that he was forgiven, that he was saved. And we know that we also have that assurance of your forgiveness, even when we're lost, when we're in our own wilderness, when we, when we treat each other poorly, when we're unkind, we know that you forgive us. And so we thank you for that, and, and we pray that you might help us to have that kind of strangely warm feeling as we worship and know your presence. And God, we also lift up to you today, we, we think about our graduating seniors and we just praise you for the, the wonderful young men that they have become as young men created in your image. We thank you for all of the, the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and teachers and coaches and, and pastors and Sunday school teachers and all others who have shaped their lives and, and helped them to become who they are today. And this day, we celebrate their accomplishments and who they are, and we also pray for them at this transitional and, and pivotal time that you would guide their journeys wherever they would go in the future. Encourage them and, and guide them and bless them into a life that is pleasing to you and following your call upon their lives, wherever that may lead them. And God, today we also remember in, in the midst of everything else, we're also mindful of the fact that tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so we do pause in, in this during this time of prayer and we give you thanks for all of the multitude of, of men and women over the years who have sacrificed their lives for the sake of freedom so that we could be free to, to worship as we are today from wherever we might be. May we never forget that sacrifice that they made. And so we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray, pray for um, all of those who have had tests, procedures, surgeries, who've gotten difficult diagnoses in this last week. We pray for those as the, the weeks of isolation go on or maybe struggling more and more with depression and anxiety and God, we just pray your mighty healing touch. We pray your strong comforter would surround all of those who are grieving different kinds of losses today. And we do lift up all of our, our nation, our world, our political leaders, our public health workers, our first responders, 
our educators, so many others we could lift up to you, Lord, but you know all the corners of this world. You know even greater than our community where there's tremendous suffering and war and injustices of all kinds. And we just pray for your mighty healing touch. We pray that, that when you would have us do so, you would inspire us and guide us and help us to be your hands and feet, bringing justice and showing mercy in this world. And Lord, again, we thank you for all you've given us. And we lift up all of these, these praises, all of these concerns, and, and all of those that have gone unspoken, but that you know, because you know everything about us. We lift up to you. And now we join our voices collectively as one as we say that beautiful prayer that you taught us. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time in our service, we invite you to a, a time of virtual offering. And so you might choose to just simply click the QR code or uh, scan the QR code on your screen or go directly to our website or write out your check that you're going to mail in to us later by hand or however you might choose to give this morning. We encourage you to take a moment and reflect on God's blessings and, and give back to the ministries of the church as God is calling you to do this morning. And now would you pray with me our offertory prayer today? A holy and generous God, Lord, as we continue to encounter you at this time of worship, we, we do offer to you these financial gifts as we remember that, that coming to you in worship is not just about receiving all the blessings and, and all the gifts that you give us and, and coming to encounter you in that way, but, but it's also about responding to the grace and the blessings that you have given us. And you, we know that you have given us so much, Lord. And so now we ask that you would take these tithes, that you would take these offerings, all these financial gifts that we give to you at this time and throughout the week, and that you would bless them, that you would use them to do your work and truly bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, as you call us to do. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs> Gospel of Matthew, starting with chapter 3, verse 13. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River so that John would baptize him. John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you, but yet you come to me? And Jesus answered, allow me to be baptized now. This is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. 
When Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water. Heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I dearly love. I find happiness in him. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since, since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus replied, It's written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. And after that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down. For it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. And Jesus replied again, It's written, Don't test the Lord your God. And then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him and angels came and took care of him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Amen. What makes you, you? Have you ever thought about that question? I mean, really, what makes you distinctly you? Because we know that every single one of us are unique. Every single one of us are, are different, and every single one of us are created in the image of God and loved by God. Even if we have any identical twins out there watching the service today, if you think about your identical twin, I think you'll probably admit and realize that that even though you're genetically the same, that your twin and you are different from one another in many ways. This idea of what makes us, us, is not a simple question. There's all kinds of things that go into shaping our identities and, and making us the beautiful people that we are. It starts with simply genetics. You know, how do does, how does the genes combine that we got from our biological moms and dads that make us hardwired into being who we are. And then beyond that, there's all kinds of environmental factors that start even with, with factors in the womb and, and the kind of environment that we're surrounded with there. 
And then after we're born, we know there's all kinds of factors like everything we breathe and what we eat and what we drink and, and what we touch and, and all these kind of things that, that somehow shape us and affect us and, and mold our identities. And then, of course, there's all kinds of factors in society and the culture that, that shape our identities, like where we're born. The fact that we're Americans affects our identities and, and who we are. Our birth order, something as simple as that, affects who we are, even if we're talking about people who grow up in the same family. We know that all siblings are even very different from each other. Whether we're the, the oldest or the only or the youngest or a middle child affects our personalities and affects our identities and, and who we are. Whether we grow up in a two-parent home or a single-parent home or grow up with grandparents or, or whatever it might be in that way, that shapes our identities and helps make us who we are. Are our families affluent or middle class or economically disadvantaged? Those factors certainly shape our identities. And we know that it certainly affects our identities as to whether we're born a, a racial or ethnic minority. That affects how people see us and, and perceive us and treat us and how we see ourselves. And of course, it affects all kinds of opportunities, what kind of opportunities we have for extracurricular activities in school even and, and jobs and education, and health care, and housing, and, and all kinds of other ways. What makes us us is really complicated. You know, today in our worship service, we're celebrating who our graduating seniors are. And today we praise God and we thank God for, for all the different factors that have made Ryan and Ian who they are today. We thank God for their families and teachers and coaches and Sunday school teachers and pastors and, and all the other kinds of people and, and events that have made them who they are today. And we pray for God's blessings on them. But even as we, we mark this milestone of graduation and celebrate that, we also know that God's not done with them yet by any stretch. We know that as Ryan goes on to air traffic control school in Oklahoma and Ian to uh, study business at UT Knoxville, that they're going to continue learning all kinds of things. They're going to meet uh, new people. They're going to become specialized in their particular areas. They're going to even learn from mistakes they make like we all do. And God's going to continue there with them, helping them to grow in their faith and grow stronger in their relationship with God and leading them into the, the paths and the call that God will have and does have on their lives, on this journey that they are in. This time of graduation marks a transition point from the end of, of one journey to the beginning of a new journey full of all kinds of opportunities and possibilities. And similarly, the baptism of Jesus and Jesus' temptation in the wilderness also served as a major transition point in Jesus' life. Up until his baptism and his uh, temptation in the wilderness, Jesus' identity had already been affected by all kinds of things like we talked about already. Of course, Jesus' identity was affected by the fact that, that he was born the Son of God. Jesus' identity was affected as he grew up as Mary and Joseph's son and in the insignificant small village of Nazareth and, and how he grew up going to synagogue and temple and, and being focused on worship and learning the scriptures and, and how he played with others when he was little. And all of those things shaped Jesus and brought him to this point. Like the experiences of all of our seniors have brought, shaped them and brought them to the point where they are. And so Jesus enters this season of, of temptation in the wilderness. And God will use it to shape him and, and firm up his identity as the Son of God and what it means to be the Son of God. God uses this wilderness time that Jesus will have to help him learn who he is. God will use it for a kind of preparation to, to prepare Jesus 
as he takes on the ministry for which he was sent to earth to do. Our wilderness time is not wasted time. In fact, I think God uses our times in the wilderness, those times when, when we're living with a sense of, of loss and scarcity and a time of chaos and uncertainty, I think God uses those times very often, most powerfully, to, to help us grow. I think it's during our wilderness times that we often become our, our strongest and our smartest. Those are the times when we truly find our closest and nearest and dearest friends. Those are the times when we grow most in our relationship with God because we learn to, to lean on God more than we do at other times. Our wilderness times are not wasted times. Those are times of amazing times that shape our identity and who we are. But they're not easy times. They're not times that any of us would choose if we had a choice. While Jesus is in the wilderness, he's starving and he's alone. Jesus has had everything stripped away from him during this season. And at this time of, of kind of being empty and, and things being uncertain, Jesus faces a time of profound testing and temptation. During this wilderness season, he's tempted to forget who he is. He's tempted to forget that, that identity that he has as the son of God, as a beloved child of God, loved by God, that was declared at his baptism. The season of temptation in the wilderness is a temptation to forget who he is. But it's also a time that God uses to more firmly than ever implant into Jesus who he is and what it means to be the son of God. The first temptation that, that Jesus faces is the temptation to simply not rely on God, to not trust God, and to try to make matters into his own hands as the Son of God. The tempter or the devil comes to Jesus and he says, Since you are God's Son, command these stones to become bread. The devil tries to convince Jesus that there's no need for him to, to sacrifice and wait around on God. Jesus has the resources at the, the tip of his fingers. Just like that, Jesus can command stones to come become bread. Jesus doesn't have to rely on God. How many times are we tempted to not rely on God, that we could just take matters into our own hands and maybe not create bread from stones, but to provide for our own resources and only rely on ourselves and not wait back, stand back and wait to see what, what God's going to provide for us. But Jesus shows us not to be phased if we face that temptation. Because Jesus responds back to the tempter. Jesus remembers God's word that people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. And so in this way, Jesus remembers what it means to be a beloved child of God. Jesus remembers who he is and his identity. The next wilderness temptation occurs when the devil brings Jesus to Jerusalem and, and they go to the highest point on the temple and the devil tries to convince Jesus to throw himself off of the temple, saying, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down. For it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Do you see what the devil does here? This always amazes me because we see the devil quoting scripture to Jesus here. The devil knows scripture. I always found that interesting. And so what the devil is doing here is that the devil is, is taking this beautiful scripture from Psalm 91 and he's ripping it out of context. And he's saying it literally back to Jesus trying to read it as, as God promising that, that God won't let any bad thing physically from ever happening to Jesus. You know, the devil says it, it says it right here in the scriptures. God will keep you from harm so that your foot won't hit a stone. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. Jesus knows better, of course. Jesus responds back and quotes scripture back to the devil, 
saying it's written, don't test the Lord your God. Jesus doesn't succumb to the foolish notion to unnecessarily put his life in, in danger and to risk himself just to test God. Jesus will trust God. Jesus won't test God. And there is a difference. Jesus remembers what it means to be a child of God through this temptation. And then the final wilderness temptation is, is probably the biggest and maybe the hardest to resist. Because at this point, the devil takes Jesus on a high mountain somewhere, and, and somehow, miraculously, Jesus is able to look out and to see all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan offers all of these kingdoms of the world to Jesus. The devil says, look out around you, Jesus. All of this can be yours. And all you have to do is bow down and worship me. Now, maybe nobody takes us up and, and says, you can control the world. But how many times are we tempted in our wilderness times of, of uncertainty and feeling like we don't have enough to maybe focus on things other than God and to try to put our attention and put our focus in, in those things that we feel like we can control, that we can be in control of? How many times do we do that? But Jesus, again, doesn't take the bait. Jesus, again, quotes scripture to the devil. And Jesus says that you are to worship the Lord your God and serve only God. And Jesus has begun with you, Satan. And then at this point, we're told that, that angels come and, and take care of Jesus during the rest of his wilderness time. Through all of these temptations, Jesus even more firmly remembers and, and claims what it means to be a beloved child of God. It doesn't mean not trusting that, that God will provide. It doesn't mean taking matters into your own hands. It doesn't mean risking your life unnecessarily, thinking God's just going to spare you from harm when you make bad choices. And it certainly doesn't mean putting your, your focus and, and attention on things, making you feel like you have more control, instead of trusting and worshiping in only the Lord our God. Jesus becomes more firmly rooted than he ever has before in who he is, in his identity as a beloved child of God during his temptation. And, you know, to our graduating seniors, I'm sure for this season, it probably feels a lot like you're in a season of wilderness and instead of just the celebration, season of celebration that it's supposed to be. I know that many of, many of you are likely feeling a sense of, of loss and, and scarcity and chaos and being out of control. And throughout your young adult years and, and even beyond that for all of your lives, we know that we will all have seasons of being in the wilderness when we will be tempted and tested. But wilderness time is not wasted time. You know, Sunday, May 24th is also Aldersgate Day in the Methodist Church. On this day in 1738, we remember John Wesley's strangely warmed experience of spiritual transformation. At this time in Wesley's life, he was very much in a season of wilderness. He was spiritually searching for God and felt like he was in this kind of place of, of spiritual desolation in his seeking. He believed in God, he loved God, but, but he longed to have a closer connection to God and to more fully trust in God. And so on May 24th in 1738, Wesley reluctantly came to a Bible study that night on Aldersgate in London. And unexpectedly, as he heard the preface to Luther's um, book of Romans read, Wesley had this strange sensation 
And Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed. And he had this experience and this assurance that, that yes, I can trust in Christ. Wesley had this experience of knowing, of having the assurance that, that he was forgiven, that he was saved. God spoke and confirmed Wesley's identity in the wilderness. And during this time of, of the wilderness, when, when Wesley's identity was, was forged at this ordinary Bible study on that night, Wesley knew who he was. Wesley knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was a beloved child of God. And the world would never be the same from that point on. You know, through the testing and, and temptation in the wilderness, we sometimes learn more about ourselves than at any other time in our lives. Our identities truly are forged during those seasons of wilderness like at no other time. I, I wonder sometimes if they have as much effect on, on our identities and shaping us into the people we are as genetics and culture and society and environment and, and all of those kinds of things. Wilderness time is not wasted time. During our time in the wilderness, God will show us a lot and teach us a lot if we will just be open to what God has to show us. And so my prayer for all of us at, at this time is that we will allow God to use this, this difficult season for good and remind us, just like Jesus was reminded, just like Wesley was reminded that night at at Alder's Gate, what it means to be a beloved God, a beloved child of God. I pray that we'll remember what this means. I pray that we won't be tempted to, to take matters into our own hands and try to just, just do everything for ourselves and not trust God. I pray that we won't try to, to put our focus and our attention on, on other things so we can feel like we have a sense of control instead of worshiping the Lord our God and serving only God. I pray that, that we won't stray from the beautiful life that God intends for us as men and women, boys and girls, created in the image of God and beloved by God. And so I pray that, that through this message and, and remembering how Jesus responded to the wilderness times, that we'll be strengthened and emboldened to be like Jesus, and to go out and, and from this wilderness season and, and go into this time worshiping the Lord our God and serving only him as we go into the new chapter of the beautiful journey that God has in store for us in, in whatever is next. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's true.
Now receive this benediction as you go from this place. May you go knowing that you are a beloved child of God, created uniquely just as you are for God's purposes. Go in the love and the grace of God, seeking to love only the Lord your God and serving only God in all you do and in everywhere you go and to everyone you meet. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.